In the summer of 64 AD, the great Roman fire was raging. It started, they think, around the Rome's chariot stadium, the Circus Maximus, and as it began to burn, it really ravished the area. In fact, six days that fire burned. People started getting out at the sixth day and seeing all the devastation that occurred and the heaviness of that, only to find out that it would reignite again and burn for another three days, to the point that when it was over with, two-thirds of the city of Rome was decimated. Now, Nero, the emperor at the time, took advantage of that opportunity to blame Christians for the inferno and its devastation that it brought about, and that brought a great intense persecution among the saints of God who were fingered for the inferno. The apostle Paul is writing to those people who have been scattered throughout the region. They went north of the Mesopotamia area. They went into the region of Turkey. All the places that you read about in the New Testament that you have a little bit of a hard time figuring out where they are, Cappadocia, Bithynia, Pontus, those areas is where many of those Christians were flourishing through that. And as they were going, they were obviously leaving everything behind. They were leaving businesses and jobs and sometimes the loss of family, the connections, the friendship, even their mother churches. They were leaving all that behind and they were under such intense hardship and persecution that Peter took moments to write a letter to them just to encourage them. And what I thought was intriguing about the initial words of this letter is that he is pointing them to the glory of Easter and all that has transpired and how that changes everything. So it's a good opportunity for us to look at this passage of Scripture from 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want to go through verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Now, there's a pew Bible in front of you, if you'll just grab that, or maybe you brought your own. Uh, that might be the case, and I hope so. Or maybe you're on the digital platforms. You'll pull it up real quick. Or you'll be really lazy and just look behind me at the screens. <laughs> There's nothing to me like opening the Bible and reading it. In our daily readings, when Kay and I are reading together, we still open the Scripture, the pages of the Bible. We've got a pencil in our hand, and we're expecting God to speak to us in a way that we need to write something down. So there's something significant about us reading God's Word from the pages of the Word. doesn't mean the others are bad. Look what he says in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've ever wondered about the oneness of God and the Lord Jesus, if Jesus is divine, that verse right there tells you not only are they unified, but he is absolutely divine. They are, they are one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the, we'll call it the full name of Jesus. It gives the, the titles and the understanding about who he is. I often call him Jesus. I often call him Lord. But I want to get back into the practice of calling him the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something about that that Peter understood is impacting. Just identifying him in the fullness of who he is. He is the Lord and he is Jesus, which means God saves. And he is Christ, which means he is king, the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his grace, great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept for you, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So Peter is writing this letter to a group of people that he absolutely loves and he wants to encourage them in all the calamity that they have faced and continuing to face. He wants to encourage them by pointing them to the promises of God. What God has been doing, what he is doing, and what he pledges to do in the future and is certain to bring about. Now Peter understood that the Lord Jesus told us that there would be great times of hardship and persecution, and those times would begin with our acceptance of him, his life, his walk, his way, his word. When you accept Christ, you are accepting a life of hardship and persecution. Make no mistake about it. 
Now that's a foreign message from many a church today in the Western Christian world, but that is the gospel. That's the way of the gospel. We come into the gospel knowing that we are exchanging some initial gratification that we could have for a more permanent gratification that will be in heaven. We will forego the things of the world today, even if it means persecution for us, knowing that there is a greater glory to come. And Peter understood Jesus' teaching about this. Words like that are defined in, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Hey, listen, if the world is buddy-buddy to you, it might be that you are not with Jesus. That's what he's saying. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But look what he says to his followers. But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You wonder why there's antagonism against you because of your faith? It's because you've been pulled out of the world. You've been brought into a kingdom of light and you remind the people who live in darkness of their sin. And they despise that. In fact, they despise it so much today that they are trying to change terminology and ways of thinking in order to just pull back the idea that there even is sin. But Jesus said it was going to be that way. He said that you and I were going to be persecuted, much like the Christians were persecuted in the day that Peter is writing this epistle. He knows the words of Jesus that are recording in Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now, people might revile you. They might persecute you. They might speak evil against you. They might act against you falsely. But listen, if it's not on account of Jesus Christ, it doesn't really matter for much. It's because of who you are in Christ. If you're demonstrating the ways of Christ, people are going to come against you. But look what Jesus says. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, if you're facing persecution because you're walking Christ, you're in good company. The prophets experienced that. Jesus himself experienced that. And fellow saints are experiencing that. What I'm trying to tell you is that Peter understood that persecution was the way for Christians. And he wants the Christians who are experiencing that to not have their attention so much on their temporary problems as they do on the eternality of their God and his promises. He wants to lift their attention. He wants to lift their focus to what is lasting. Now, that doesn't mean that he's belittling the problems. He's not. Some of you have significant issues and hardships and struggles and trials, temptations that you are in the midst of. Such teachings remind us that our eternal God is bigger than our temporary problems and our present troubles are not worth comparing to the future glory that is yet to be revealed to us. That's what Peter's lifting. So what does he say to Christians who are in deep trouble with grief, sorrow, and hardship Relative to their walk in Christ, here's what he says, two words, praise God. Praise God. In the midst of that, praise God. And I want to spend the rest of our time just unfolding that. What does he mean by that? Why is that important? Why is it meaningful to us and significant to us? Easter reminds us that God is worthy of our praise, as if we needed any reminders. Easter really lifts that. Our troubles and disappointments and hardships and trials and anxieties, they do not thwart the wondrous Easter truths. Although the world is fractured and it is faltering, we can be sure that heaven remains unchanged and the promises of God are uncompromised. Though we might experience losses in this world, and we will, we can be certain that the eternal treasures of our inheritance are secure in heaven, and Peter wants his readers to know that. Though you and I might lose loved ones in this life, and for sure we will, we know that if they are alive in Christ by faith, then they are with him forever alive with Christ. And though we may suffer hardship and persecution today, we can be certain of the truth that Jesus is our eternal living hope. There is always hope when you're looking towards Christ Jesus. So Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless him. Just bless him. Now in the first century, blessing God was really a way of life, especially for those Jewish people who are messianic. 
They're Jewish by heritage and they have trusted in Jesus as their Messiah. And as they go into the synagogues, they would hear quoted three times a day in the synagogue the 18 blessings. And all 18 blessings in the very same way. And it's just this, blessed be thou, O Lord, our God. Every time 18 of those blessings are read out, they finish in the same way. Blessed be thou, O Lord, our God. 18 times three is 54. Can you imagine a service that would last throughout the day and 54 times we're just blessing God? That's a good practice for us to be in, not that we're gonna have to go around counting 54 times, but just be in a perpetual state of blessing God. What a joy that would bring into our life and what a different perspective it would bring as we see what is going on around us. So Peter calls all Christians of all times to bless God. Now I'm gonna mention three of them that come out of these short verses. The first is this, bless God for he extends great mercy to us. Bless God because he extends great mercy to us. In fact, we bless God simply because he is merciful. And because he is merciful, he is extending mercy. Now we should note that mercy is valuable to us where sin exists. Now where there's no sin, there's no need for mercy, but I haven't seen a place or a person yet without sin. So there is always a need of mercy and that's what makes mercy so valuable because we are all sinners. Earl Mashburn must have had a particularly rough morning he was the VOAG teacher at St. Clair High School where Kay and I were attending high school. One year, he was my homeroom teacher and back then, uh, homeroom was done a little bit differently. It wasn't our first class. It was the first 15 minutes of the day. And the homeroom teacher was simply there to take role of everybody in his or her homeroom and to keep you quiet enough that you could hear the staticky announcements that were coming through that little brown speaker that was hanging on the wall. Now, Mr. Mashburn was normally very easy to get along with, but this day was a little bit different. This day, he was somewhat agitated, or maybe it was the students who were the agitators. I don't quite remember which. But this day, he was a little bit different. He would say things like this. Y'all quieten down now. And all the chatter and all the banter would continue among us, the laughing, the cutting up or whatever. And he would get a little bit more aggravated. And he said, now, listen, I don't want to hear anything else out of you. Now, when you're 15 and your brain isn't quite yet finished forming <laughs> and your thoughts are still a little bit squishy and are not firmed up to what would be considered reasonableness yet, that little talk... I don't want to hear anything else from you stirred in the cranial shortcomings that I had that what Mr. Mashburn really wanted was one more little whiff of laughter through the room. So I made, with my back to that lanky teacher, a guttural sound with the slumping of the shoulders that you have all done. <laughs> and that little moment stirred Laughter that went throughout the entire room like it only can when you know you are not supposed to laugh or make noise. I can remember it like it was yesterday. His right out eyebrow raised and he said, Gunner, you stick around after everybody else is gone. You've got three licks coming. Now I know he was not talking about the center of a Tootsie Pop. He went on to the back shop area where I figured he had his paddle. And as everybody else was filing out of the room, I sat there awkwardly waiting for him to return. And the first period class started coming in. Hey, Randy, what are you doing here? You don't have this class, so I'm waiting. <laughs> Soon the bell would be ringing and I would have to be there in my first class. And because I'm a good student, I didn't want to be late for class. And since he was late in coming, I just thought, well, I'll just go on to my first class. And I did. Now, I don't know if old Lude Mashburn gave me mercy or if he got distracted and forgot, but I didn't come back 
and I didn't say anything else to him I think in some way people think that maybe God is like that and maybe he's not really paying that much attention maybe he's distracted with all the things that's going on in the cosmos maybe he's just gonna forget about it but I want you to hear that the Bible says the absolute opposite of that John one of the apostles was given an opportunity to see into the future and he saw the day of judgment it was so overwhelming to him but he was able to write it down and he began to describe what he saw in Revelation chapter 20 where John is seeing God himself on the judgment seat there on that white throne judgment and people are trying to hide they're trying to scurry away and hide but John says there is nowhere for them to hide and he begins to write the description of what he saw and he said and I saw the dead small and great standing before the throne the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done man that last line just gets me according to what they had done by the way when you read in the new testament that the dead are standing before christ what he's talking about is those who are dead in their sin they're spiritually dead they're standing before god giving an account of everything that keeps them dead spiritually and if they're spiritually dead they're not going to be able to stay in the presence of god the father in fact they're going to be cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth where there is a literal place called hell john has given us that warning and he goes on in the writing saying the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and Hades talking about the grave there gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one of them according to what they had done now that's a hard fact to consider but God records every sin ever committed of every person of all time and he requires justice from every single person that's what it's like to be a just God he doesn't say, oh, I'm going to give that person a pass, but I'm going to make that person pay. No, he says, I'm just through and through. Everybody will be accountable to every sin of all time. They will be held accountable for that. Our sin doesn't go unnoticed. It doesn't go unrecorded, and we are not unaccountable. Apart from God's mercy and our surrender to him, everyone is condemned and judged for all eternity. In fact, he goes on to read that if anyone's name is not found in the, written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Can I just put it real simply out here? We need God's mercy. Our sin is undeniable. We are guilty and we know it. And because of that, for those of us who receive God's mercy, we bless God because he extends mercy to us. For those with saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God forgives. Bless God, he forgives. And he erases the sin and even the record of sin that was held against us and the debt of sin and judgment that was held against us, he erases it all. He justifies us. I love that word. It means it's just as if we've never sinned when Jesus finishes cleansing us. In a marvelous, miraculous way, Jesus has the imputed sin of us on him. In other words, God took our sin and put it onto his son and he died there on the cross of Calvary with all the weight of justice being poured out by God and all of his holy wrath coming against his son to the point that it was completely finished and Jesus says, it is finished. I bore it all every drop of wrath and justice for all of mankind I have bore it all and for those of us who trust in Christ to do that there's a great exchange he has taken our sin upon himself and he gives to us his righteousness so that we can be justified before God that's the glorious message of Easter that's what Good Friday is about that's what Easter Sunday is about and that's what Peter is pointing to in fact, I don't know a single gospel writer that didn't point to that. Paul points to it in Ephesians chapter two, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us together alive, uh, alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we bless God because he's extended great mercy to us. Anybody in here a recipient of God's mercy? 
Anybody in here in need of God's mercy? He's extending it, my friends. He's extending it. But secondly, bless God because he has caused us to be born again. He has caused us. The power is on him. The choice is his. He has done this work. And what has he done? He's caused us to be born again. Our salvation is rooted in God's attribute of mercy, all right? Your salvation, if you're saved, it's based on, it's rooted in the attribute of God's mercy. You didn't earn it. God gave it. God mercifully extended it to you. And that's good news because you don't have to climb your way to God. You don't have to crawl your way through goodness to get to God. God will take you, we'll sing it in a few minutes, God will take you just as you are if you're willing to walk away where you've been. He'll extend mercy to you. He'll give you that mercy and he will make you to be born again. He provides that for us while we are yet sinners. Now, God doesn't demand us to get our act together. He doesn't demand from us to turn our lives around before we come to him. Salvation starts with us recognizing our need because of sin for God's mercy and then trusting him to provide that through Jesus Christ, trusting him to give us a new life from heaven born again. At Easter, God is making provisions for us to be born again, making us together, all together new. And we needed to be all together new because we were all together born in sin and brokenness. And there's nothing that we're gonna be doing that's gonna change that. I can't take a life of sin and somehow magically make it into a life without sin. I need God to do something in me. I need God to transform me. I need God to take the old and do away with it and bring in the new and let me live in that. And that's what all of us need. That's what Easter is providing for us. We were born in sin and trespasses. We walked in sin and trespasses. We're like the rest of the world. There's no self-help to get us out of the brokenness of the sin of our life. You can't suddenly make your way better. You can't make your life better. You can't change any marking of sin that's already in your life. The only remedy for our sinfulness is to be born again. It's the only remedy. If you're here today because you're trying to think, maybe I can live better, maybe I can do better, maybe I can have more good in my life, maybe in the end God will be satisfied with me. Look, you're on the wrong direction. The only direction, the only way is to come to Jesus and say, can we start this all over again? Will you give me new life from heaven above and make me to be born again? That's what he wants and that's what Easter is providing. When you and I put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God transforms us supernaturally. He makes us to be born spiritually anew. Our new life in Christ replaces the old life and our old nature gets put to death with Christ Christ on the cross and our new nature comes alive through Christ in the resurrection. In the Gospel of John, there's a Jewish religious leader that we're introduced to. His name is Nicodemus who came to Jesus one night. Now, this guy seems to have his act together, and he has had his act together for a long time. His whole adult life has been that way. He was all about obeying the law of God and trying to train other people to obey the law of God as well. Nicodemus is one of the elite. He's a scholar, he's a legalist, he's an honored rabbi, he's among the leading ruling party of the Sanhedrin. If you were one climbing the religious ladder, it would be Nicodemus that you would find on the top rungs as you were moving your way up. One night, though, he approaches Jesus. He can't quite put his finger on it, but something's not quite right yet. It's not complete. And all this working and all this striving and all this gaining and all this doing and all this teaching and all this knowledge He still feels short. And he wants to inquire of Jesus about that. Now, Jesus knows the hearts of every person, every man, woman, child. Jesus knows. And before Nicodemus can even get into the discussion, Jesus interrupts, puts him on his heels, saying these words, truly, truly. That would be like you and me saying in the South, hey, listen to me. Listen to me. He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
He puts him on his heels because Nicodemus' entire life has been to be a good doer. One who would strive to please God. One who would obey the law, help others obey the law. But Jesus tells him right out front, you must be born again. Now, if anybody could earn spiritual life, somebody might think Nicodemus would be the one who could do it. But Jesus lets him know that even though he's a rule follower, a leader of Judaism, a teacher of scripture, and given to the things of God, he, like everybody else, must be born again. Nicodemus knew something was off. He knew he fell short. He just didn't know how to go about finding the answers. Maybe you're that, that way today. Maybe there's something registering in your heart, maybe in your thoughts. Lord, I'm missing something. I'm trying. I've turned this area of my life around or that area of my life around. Maybe you're feeling what Nicodemus was feeling, short of what is necessary to have eternal life with God. Perhaps you're asking the questions internally. What else do I need to do? What do I need to add? What do I need to start? What do I need to stop? Listen to the words of Jesus. He wants them to be so simple. You must be born again. You must. From the churchgoer to the never been in church, you must be born again. The new life in God is not about adding more goodness to your life. It's throwing out everything in your life, including all that you thought was good, and starting over again, born from heaven above, spiritually born alive by your faith in Jesus Christ, turning away from all that you've been in and turning to all that he is being born again in faith. God desires you to have this new spiritual life and he mercifully is offering it to you as a gift to be received by you. And he provides that new birth for everybody who will come to him. You say, you don't know me. Oh, I don't, may not know you. I may not know the circumstances of your life. I may not know the sin that's dark and deep and hidden in your life, but God does. I know God and he's extended mercy to everybody. He's calling out to everybody, whosoever will may come. I know God, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't have to perish. Hey, that's you. That's you. This might be the day. God has explained that new life begins when a person looks with faith upon Jesus on that crucified, crucified cross. A long time ago, the people of Israel were rebellious, they were godless, and they were unruly. God had been leading them, but they were so self-driven. God found that they were speaking against him and speaking against his servant Moses and completely disobedient to the things that had been told to them. So he judged them, brought judgment into them. This is a strange judgment, one that I wouldn't want to be part of. He sent biting venomous snakes in their midst. And they were literally biting the people of Israel and many of them were dying. When they realized that this was God's judgment upon them for their sin, they began to confess with Moses. And here's what they said. We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Now there's a whole lot going on in this text, but it's moving us even further in history. I'll just mention a couple of things. The Lord is ordering Moses at that point to craft a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Do you remember this narrative? And he puts that serpent up on a pole and he has that erected before the people. And the people who were inflicted with the judgment of God were to come to that serpent and look at it. Now, when they looked at it, some things were going on. Number one, they were acknowledging their sin. They knew their sin brought about that judgment and they were acknowledging the sin in their life. They were secondly acknowledging that they were in a desperate condition, that there was no way they were gonna rescue themselves, no way that they were gonna heal themselves. They needed to come to God's submissive instruction. Thirdly, they needed to know that this was God's holy judgment against them. And fourth, they needed to know that God was the one who would be able to deliver them. So when they came and they looked at that bronze serpent put on that pole, all of that is going through their minds and God gives them 
the freedom from those serpents and he heals them from their diseases from that. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about being born again, he brings that narrative up. He draws him back to that historical moment in the life of Israel. And he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So listen to what he's saying. If you want to experience God's provision of mercy and spiritual new birth, then look to Jesus on the cross. Look to him with your sin on that cross. Look to him as his body is nailed to that tree, cursed, because that is your curse. That is my curse. Look to him there, and in doing so, you and I are admitting our life of sin. We are repenting from that, which is the Bible term for turning around and going in a different direction. We are having faith that God is mercifully providing our deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord on that cross and in his resurrection. So Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be be born again and to be born again you need to look to Jesus on the cross you need to know what God is providing through me to bring about your new birth so by God's mercy our old sinful ways die with Jesus on the cross and by God's grace our new life is given to us in the resurrection it's what today is all about the new life that's why we sing with such excitement that's why we're not uh, down in the dumps today We are thrilled because this is the day that changes everything. Now, third thing. I'm going to scamper through this one very quickly. Bless God, not just because of the mercies he's extended. Bless him for the new life that he's given, being spiritually born again. But bless him for he gives an inheritance. God's mercy towards us. And his new spiritual mirth given to us, those are great reasons to bless him. But he's going to add one more. And then as God is providing eternal inheritance for us through the resurrection, and he keeps that treasure secure in heaven. So you've got to remember, Peter is writing to people who are losing everything. They're under intense persecution and hardship, trials and calamity. And so he's pointing them to an inheritance in heaven that is absolutely secure. They may be losing everything on earth, but what they have in heaven is absolutely secure by God himself. He describes this inheritance as imperishable. It means it's never going to spoil, it's never going to degrade, it's never going to pass away. It's undefiled, which means nothing negative is going to ever alter it. It will be pure and right forever what God has given to you in your salvation and all that is afforded to you in that, it will forever be. And it's unfading. It's gonna always hold its brilliance, its beauty and its glory. It's unlike the flowers. When we see flowers, we're just awestruck by them. We're just loving the beauty of the flowers. Kay has some flowers right now in our dining room. And I was passing by yesterday and they were kind of looking a little droopy. I said, hey, I got to get you some water in this vase. And she said, yeah, they're they're struggling right now. She's hoping they're going to last to dinner when the family is together today. But they may not last till dinner. If they do do last to dinner, they won't be lasting another day or so. Because that's what flowers do. What Peter is saying is that your inheritance in heaven is not like that. It's never fading. It's always as beautiful, always as glorious, and always as brilliant as ever. Forever and ever it remains as it now is, awaiting you securely in heaven. And I think that's encouraging for us because no doubt this last year has been difficult. Easter last year was the first time in the history of this church that we did not gather together corporately in an area where we could worship together. It's never happened. And if God's willing, it will never happen again. And that began, for me at least, the start of a long journey. You say, well, COVID started before that. Well, the first weeks of COVID, I was ignorant enough to think, oh, we'll be back to normal pretty soon. It was about Easter time that I realized, hmm, there is not a normal. And so for the last 12 or 13 months, there's been struggle, hasn't there? We've recognized with all the sickness and all the precautions and all the lockdowns and even some deaths, 
We've recognized this thing. I think it's the most valuable lesson for us. Christians, this world is perishable, it is defiled, and it is fading. Our thought, our vision, and our hope rest in the inheritance of Christ that is in heaven awaiting us that is absolutely secure. That's our hope. So it's Easter, my friends. God is offering to you mercy. He's offering to you a new birth, total new start, new record. He's offering to you an inheritance that is absolutely perfect, a salvation kept for you in heaven. The question is, will you receive it today? I'm going to ask you as we will soon end this message with an invitation to step in faith quite literally. I'll have people standing down front and although you might be nervous, if you're here today and you believe God has spoken to your heart and you need his mercy, you need his start with a new birth and you need that inheritance of salvation, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith come down the aisle and address one of the people who are standing here here's all you need to say I need to be born again let them encourage you and pray with you I promise you this I will not embarrass you I'm not going to turn around and address the audience on your behalf I'm not going to introduce you to the audience this will be a simple conversation between you and one person who loves you Maybe you'll exchange phone numbers, a way to get connected to each other. Maybe you'll stick around for a few minutes to have a conversation. I don't know. But I believe it'll be the beginning of a great start for you that Christ himself promises to bring to completion. But you're going to have to have faith. And you're going to have to have enough unction to step down that aisle and take that walk here. Now, a number of us have already received the mercy of Christ. We've been made new in Christ, born again from heaven above, and we have that internal inheritance secure in us. You know what our response is? Bless God. Bless him. For we didn't earn any of that. There was no reason why he should offer that to us, do that for us. Bless him. Because he is who he is, and he has acted in the ways that he acts. May our song be full of blessing. Some of you may want to pull aside and just bless God here at the platform steps. There might be another decision you're making about Christ or your family or this church. You come. If we can help you with that, we certainly want to do so. Now let me pray for you. Lord, in this moment, I thank you and bless you, our God and Father of Jesus Christ. Bless you for the mercy that you have extended to us and is now being extended in this moment. For those who are watching on the streaming broadcast, listening on the radio, or hearing this message after the fact, or in this room, we praise you for providing the new birth that is ours in Jesus Christ by faith, and we bless you for the inheritance that securely awaits us in heaven. By the work of your Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection, we submit our lives to you for you alone are living hope. In the name of Jesus.